um, what you've all touched on here is your data, where your data is, what is the data that was exposed. Um, and Tim, I know in our prep discussion, we talked a little bit about, along with the key stakeholders here, the in-house leader, the law firm partner, and the cyber insurer, there's kind of a fourth uh, key stakeholder, and that's the technology team, your technologists. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how do you go about finding, you know, the exposed data? Um, how, what, what kind of technologies do you use? Um, you know, we like to talk about the use of artificial intelligence, you know, to particularly help with that unstructured data challenge that becomes um, pretty poignant with a, a data breach incident. So kind of let's, let's talk a little bit about the like, what and where, how do you find this data? Where do you start? Uh, thanks. Yeah, we, we did have a good discussion on that. I think that's maybe sort of an overlooked aspect of any kind of a an event response, because certainly everybody's familiar with the need to retain outside counsel, the need to have insurance up front, very important aspects. Um, once you've discovered the problem, whatever the problem is, is there a forensics aspect? Uh, or more importantly, is there a response aspect? Let's stop the bleeding. That's That's obvious. And then let's try to figure out what may have been impacted. But then once you've figured out what it may have been impacted, it's, it's unlikely to be a small database. It's going to be large database, series of databases, unstructured data uh, that you have to go through and figure out what may have been accessed, what may have been compromised so that we can notify regulators, partners. I mean, who are we on the hook to inform now? and what might be the potential exposure or loss to ourselves, as well as our partners, as well as our customers. So at, at, at another firm, we had a, uh, an event where it took us a long time to pile through the data, and we needed some assistance in just, just the quantities of data, unstructured data, filtering through it, because you have limited resources, and most of them are pointed toward fixing the immediate problem. But then in order to start talking about which attorney, state attorney general do I notify? Which, you know, how do, what do I tell my regulators? What do I prep my communications team? I needed to know what the data was. And if there's a long time to, to, to comb through it, um, then I would argue that one of the other partners that you'd want to consider talking to before an event, along with outside counsel, along with insurance, along with a forensics firm, is some sort of analytics firm or a discovery firm or some firm that's used to combing through large quantities of data um, identifying important um, sets or subsets or um, attributes of the data so that you can then go to the privacy team or the regulatory relations team and say, okay, we've gone through all this. This is what it is. You guys make the decision. But it's the extended period of time of identifying what it is, finding out where it was that can be shortened if you've brought in a partner beforehand They've learned your network more or less, not day to day, but certainly at the macro level, they know what to pull and they sort of know what your data is. They're familiar with your data tables, so they know what to look for. So that kind of preparation, I think, is very helpful and shortens the, the period of uncertainty. Yeah, and Tim's hit on an important point from a state regulatory standpoint and federal. So the no breach notification period under HIPAA is 60 days uh, after you discovered or reasonably should have discovered an incident. Some states like Florida, it's 30 days. Ohio, for example, is 45 days. Other states are as soon as reasonably practical. So the, the advice that Tim just gave is great that you want to have that, that AI vendor lined up in advance so they're familiar with your system and can quickly get through the records. Because one of the great ways to increase potential liability, either from a regulator standpoint or a class action, is to delay notification because by not notifying consumers that are impacted, you're potentially harming their individual, their ability to put in things like credit monitoring or credit or fraud alerts or things like that. So it is essential to be able to quickly get and figure out who you need to notify. And you know, the old fashioned way of pouring through thousands and thousands of emails manually takes a long time. Trust me, I've done that and it is, it's, a, it's a tough exercise. Mm -hmm. um, now there are some things where you, you know, a lawyer certainly has to look at it and I, I don't think you know, we're saying that you're just off completely outsourcing that, but by reducing that amount that lawyers have to actually put an eye on, you know, an algorithmic pattern, by the way, can find a social security number much faster than I could ever find it in a, in a 50 page PDF. But, you know, some other things, calls will have to be made. So, but I think Tim has hit on a really important point about the speed with which you were able to go through compromised records and either a ransomware attack, a business email compromise or any kind of security incident. 
Yeah, business or uh, information, uh, you know, identification and, 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 and classification is one of the kind of one of the core underwriting touch points that that we look at. And I would say that in general, companies are doing a, you know, a far better job of that today than they were 15 years ago. And I'm sure both both, you know, Tim and Matt could have horror stories from, you know, the, the bad old days when a, an organization would suffer a hack or some sort of data breach and you know they were uncovering equipment that they didn't know existed with data that they didn't know they had which had been you know outdated for you know 30 or 40 years just in in, in completely unnecessary to, to maintain mm -hmm. but the but the whole exercise in <clears throat> you know knowing what you've got knowing where it is and knowing you know what is the most sensitive just on a very practical standpoint, allows you to protect it more effectively and then meet the newer regulatory requirements that dictate, um, you know, conscious management of, you know, data collection and data processing and data destruction. You know, you can't do, you, you know, you can't satisfy your requirements under GDPR or CCPA unless you've got a good handle on your you know, your digital assets so that's something that you know insurance underwriters certainly look at and when push comes to shove after a ransomware event or after a data breach or or you know after anything negative happens um you know a little a little upfront work on that score goes a lot uh, goes a long way in allowing you to dig yourself out of your uh, out of the hole a lot more quickly Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Brad just hit a really important point that people, I, I'm sure Tim is familiar with this, but document and record retention is a huge part of cybersecurity. Um, we have created a world of, of data hoarders, people that keep every email they've ever gotten um, and are not deleting things. And that's a problem from a data breach uh, standpoint, as well as a litigation standpoint. If you keep everything, you're increasing the uh, threat landscape that attackers can get information. So as long as your organization is not subject to a litigation hold, getting rid of old data or at least keeping it in a separate system that is not within your email is a great way to reduce the threat landscape. Yeah. And, and can I echo that last point uh, from a privacy perspective, GDPR and otherwise, I mean, one of the basic principles of privacy is don't collect what you don't need make sure you inform what you've collected and don't keep it any longer than you need it. So precisely to that point of get rid of it if you don't need it, if there's a breach and you're notifying people about records that you collected eight years ago or 10 years ago from them, a very reasonable question that they're gonna ask is, well, why was it even around? Why, why could it have been exposed? You have, no longer have a legitimate need for it. You should have gotten rid of it in the first place. So retention equals greater risk exposure. So turning to one of the questions um, that we received from the audience, and I think it's a, an interesting one, just given the theme of our series, The Inevitable. Um, if you could kind of take a, a magic crystal ball and look into the future, um, what do you think are some of the most important um, you know, pieces of technology or, or ways that technology in particular will be able to help um, with this, this challenge? So whether it's a specific particular challenge within the whole data breach uh, scenario that really is kind of screaming out for a technology solution or just something that you wish you had or your clients had or um, as an insurer you wish, you know, there was another um, type of, you know, panel that you could be offering those services. What are your kind of thoughts around technology in this space? I'll, uh, it's Tim, I'll, I'll start. Um... So obviously with text IQ, the focus is on artificial intelligence and machine learning, the, the ability to crunch through large quantities of data and find um, relationships or uh, contextual connections that might not otherwise have been seen. So we've, we've done a proof of concept in the discovery um, space and found it to, to reveal some things we didn't, didn't know or couldn't have anticipated. Um, so as I was talking with one of my colleagues about the use of artificial intelligence, I asked him what the risk was. And he said, Tim, there are two risks, using it and not using it. So using it, obviously, we, we need to know what you're, what you're working with. And if you're doing breach response or you're combing through data and using an artificial intelligence partner, 
you need to understand how it works so you can explain it to your execs just at a high level so that they can value the, the, the output. The risk of not using it, I think increasingly is going to be that as it gets commoditized or at least expected, sort of like maybe, you know, cloud is now, but was not 10 years ago. Um, if you're not using artificial intelligence for combing through large quantities of data, like possibly after a breach, um, the question might be, why not? You could have done it quicker. You kind of could have done it more effectively. Why didn't you do that? And it's going to become expected rather than sort of cutting edge. I would say uh, this is an great, greatly high tech, but multi-factor authentication, uh, especially in the time of COVID when most of us are working remotely. Uh, most of the breaches I've worked on since March have been because organizations did not have multi-factor authentication in place. Uh, it's the number one recommendation of all the IT service providers I work with. And it's generally the thing that the regulators ask why you didn't have it in place when this incident happened. So um, I think that certainly helps to create a more robust cyber profile for any organization, big or small. And and Liz, the 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 question just kind of triggered the thought in me that uh, you know <clears throat> Matt mentioned uh, multi-factor authentication. You know, data encryption is obviously important, but in an era where companies are increasingly using both companies and the bad guys are increasingly using artificial intelligence and machine learning and, you know, down the road, you know, some degree of quantum computing, uh, it's going to render all of those security protections kind of meaningless. So it's, it's, uh, network security is so hard and it's such a, you know, 10 foot wall and 11 foot ladder problem that the, um, you know, the, the the issues and the solutions are both developing, you know, a little bit behind the technology themselves, uh, or the technologies themselves. So it's, um, you know, it's a good question, but it's it's not an easy one to answer. Absolutely. And Liz, I think the other thing that's really important, it goes back to my initial comment about human error. You know, if, if an employee clicks on an email and provides his or her credentials, for example, and then says, oh, this my, something's wrong, just shuts down his or her computer and walks away, can have a major impact on an organization. So it's creating a corporate, a business culture where people, people are, are encouraged to actively report when something like that happens. Because, you know, the forensic folks can't help, Tim, the people like Tim in the world can't help. Nobody can provide help unless they know that something like this happened. So being Understanding the need to quickly report something, understanding that there is a mechanism out there to do that is really important, no matter what the size of the organization. 